Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Good afternoon. Um, As you can tell, we probably added a new introduction. Felt inspired uh, to change change things up. And as you can tell, uh, we have a pulpit now. I made it this morning. Um, this is more of a test. I've actually wrote a sermon a while ago. It's not too deep, but it's kind of basic, I guess. Um, trial and error. Trial and error. I felt inspired, but also convicted at the same time to write a sermon. So that's what, um, we're going to start doing, um, I'm just glad that people are tuning in and really getting a message. I'm not reading anything right now on it, so I pray that you guys enjoy it, and um, let's get started. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for everything that you've done and that you've provided for us. We are eternally grateful. We can't thank you or praise you enough. We love you. We want you. Father, we ask you to teach us and to guide us and to humble us each and every day to your word and to the people you've put into our lives. Father, we pray for less of us and more of you. And we pray for our listeners and our watchers. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Well, let's get to it. Honestly, um, since this is our first pulpit and written sermon, I'm just going to just, doesn't really have a title, so hopefully I have one um, before I post it. Let's get to it. All right, in John 10, 33, we are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Now, the Pharisees only stoned Jesus for one reason. There was only one reason why he was, I'm sorry, not stoned, but crucified. They couldn't get him for any other charges. The only charge that they can get him for was the fact that he was claiming to be God. And that's what led to his crucifixion. The Lord said to my Lord, now this is in the Psalms, but in Matthew twenty-two forty-four, 44, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In Psalms um, 110, verse 1, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In the Psalms, David saw Jesus' resurrection and taking a seat at the right hand side of God when he said, I saw my Lord say to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies my footstool. Jesus is, I mean, I'm sorry, David, King David at the time, uh, in this Psalms is... He's in the Holy Spirit. He's The Spirit is revealing to him, God, is revealing God, say to God, come and sit at my right hand. So he's already proclaiming that he saw Jesus' resurrection. He saw his Redeemer being, being resurrected and ascending to heaven before it even happened. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies my footstool. Now, God promises us the same thing. He says, when we put our trust in Jesus and we follow the Spirit, 
God, too, will make our enemies our footstool. But it's only when we are abiding in Christ, when we are depending on Christ for our salvation through an active relationship. The wrath of God is being, okay, I'm sorry, Romans 1, 18 and 1, 25. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of, man, of people who, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, what Paul is getting at is he's saying, sin blinds your heart and it blinds your eyes and your mind from believing of God's existence and from experiencing him. Sin is a veil. It covers the eyes. It covers the mind. It covers the heart. It hardens it. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Only God is the most holy. So, only God is pure. He's the only one who's holy. And uh, we get invited into that relationship when we follow the Holy Spirit and when we obey the Holy Spirit and when we live our lives according to God's will through obedience. There is no other way to uh, know God. It's only through Jesus Jesus calls us to be holy. He says, be holy for I'm holy. Now, I know that there's a lot of other religions out there claiming that they have holiness, like the Dalai Lama in the Buddhist religion. That's not true. For there's only one who's perfect and one who's holy. And as God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit And no matter how hard we try, we're never going to be as holy as him. But we can walk in obedience and be sanctified and set apart from the world. It doesn't mean that we're perfect or holy in the sense of perfect. But all it means is that we're living the way God is allow, uh, accepts. Now... People worship all kinds of things. They worship other people. They worship celebrities. They worship, um, sometimes they worship their suffering. Uh, people worship, anything can be worshipped outside of God. So we have this kind of like imbalance in our equilibrium or our lives or our thinking. And what begins to happen is, on the right hand, you have people who worship themselves and they think that they're better than everybody and then on the left hand you have people who worship themselves and they think that they're the worst thing that's ever happened and they can never get better or whatever they're always playing the victim both are an abomination to God Paul speaks about it um, people worship all kinds of things they worship uh, their talents, their gifts, and stuff like that. Now, God doesn't give us idols. He doesn't want us to worship idols, but he does give us talents, and he does give us um, gifts. But we are to use that to minister, to do his will, and to show Christ to others. Jesus is the invisible God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the in the physical, in the visible. So that if you're curious about who is God and what is he like, God shows us what he's like through his only son, Jesus. So when we look at Jesus Christ, we see the image of God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The first over all creation. He has no beginning and he has no end. Jesus is God in the flesh. 
fully God and fully man. God only listens to those who have faith. Now, many people have all kinds of faith. We can believe in ourselves. We can believe in celebrities. We can believe in false doctrines and, and all kinds of stuff we can worship. However, God only listens to those who believe in him uh, and his son. There's a verse that says, he who has does not have the son does not have the father. Many people claim that they know God. But when we speak about God as being Jesus, oh, the Jesus is a teacher, or Jesus is just a, another person. or But God is saying, anyone who acknowledges the son has the father. But it, those who don't acknowledge the son don't have the father. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Like I said, many people have faith, but many people don't have faith in Jesus. Maybe Many people don't have faith in God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He rewards us when we seek him. What does that mean? When we're looking for him. In other, in other words how to please him what 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 he finds acceptable now if i'm living a lifestyle or i have behaviors and i'm seeking to please god and the word of god says this is how you please him he gives us instructions on how to live and he gives us instructions on how to behave and by faith we behave the way the scriptures tells us to behave and by faith we live according to what the Bible says, and how we should live. But if we do not have faith, we do not apply what the Bible says by our behavior or by the way we live. This is how the world knows that we are believers, and this is how we know that people also believe in God by the way they live and the way they behave. The Lord, the Lord's will and prayer. James 4, 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So in other words, God gave, gives us his will. So, for example, when, when someone that's a relative dies and they have a will that they leave behind, it's basically a list of things that they have, right? And let's just say there were um, some sort of uh, standard of, of the only way to obtain things from the will. You have to live up to a certain standard or you have to do certain things, right? But there's only certain things on that will. So, for example, if I were to leave a will for my kids, and I had a house, and I had a car, and I had a motorcycle, and I had a lot of things, TV and bicycle or whatever, and my children ask for what's on the will, then they can get it. But if they ask with wrong motives, like, oh, did dad leave a Ferrari behind? Obviously, I probably won't leave a Ferrari behind, but it's not on the will. So asking with wrong motives is asking things that's not in God's will. And what is God's will? Well, he gave us it in his word, the Holy Bible. There's no other Bible. There's only one. So if you don't want to know what God's will for your life is, then you look at the Holy Bible and you see exactly what his will's will is. And he will show you exactly what um, your rewards will be, uh, such as, Abraham in the Old Testament. God cannot be threatened. So I've heard a lot of people say things like, 
and I prayed mightily or I screamed at God or I said, God, you better change this or do something or I'm not going to do this. Now, <laughs> God can't be threatened. Matthew 6.10 and James 1.13. Matthew 6.10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says the same thing as he's saying, Let this cup pass from me, God. Lord, and lo and behold, he did not let that happen, and he still died on the cross. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. God is not threatened by Satan, demons, or man's threats. Cursing slash accusing, God is uh, treating To threaten God, in other words, is is like to threaten a timeless being with time. He's timeless. He's eternal. You can't threaten someone who's eternal with time. And that's what it's like. Or threatening someone with inflicting pain to them who can't feel pain. Now, am I saying that God can't feel pain? Absolutely not. We're made in His image. We can feel pain. God can feel pain. But what I am saying is to threaten Him is not realistic because He can't, he can't be threatened. He can't be moved. And if He could be moved in a, in a way that contradicts His holiness, His character, then, then He wouldn't be God. Or threatening someone to kill someone who can't die. I'm going to kill you, but you can't die. So, I'm not saying that these are perfect analogies. What I'm saying is, like the psalm says, God is my refuge. God is my shield. He's my sword. He's not a literal sword. He's not a literal sort of refuge. Those are just analogies of ways to explain what he's like. And those are my analogies to explain how we cannot threaten God. So why, why, when those people say those kind of things, how are they getting what they want? Because it's on his will, in other words. And God sees the faith. How bad they want it. Knock and you will receive, beg, and I will open up the door. God laughs at the rulers of this world. So I know there's a lot of things going on in this world right now, and it's very um, intense and in it feels like the end of the world every day, right? But it's not. God laughs. And if we could see through the eyes of the Lord, we would laugh too, I believe. Psalms 2, Psalms chapter 2, verse 2 through 4, and Psalms chapter 73, uh, verse 17, says this, The kings of the earth rise and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw away their shackles, throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. God laughs at all the rulers in this world who plan and scheme for their judgment slash end will soon come. Do not fear the rulers of this world because they have already been judged and in a moment they will soon meet their end. It will be like they never existed. In other words, I've prayed and I've asked, I said, God, why do you allow, basically, non, non, long story short, I don't think every politician is horrible, but I think most of them probably are. And I asked them, why do you allow them to live a long life, man? Like, and, and, and it seems like people who have little to nothing or are a little threatening and in, who seem very nice and kind, they die on a regular basis. I mean, we got kids dying at a very young age for all kinds of reasons. People who are young who are dying. And I think of all these political people and I'm like, why don't they just, you know, <laughs> but... I believe that he's giving them a chance to repent. Just like all people. So, with that being said, sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 to John 3, 3. Our sin separates us from experiencing God. 
In other words, like I said at the beginning of this sermon, it's because of sin that we can't experience God. We're living in sin. Or, in other words, we're living disobedient to God's will. Right? And I get it. It's hard to trust a God that you can't physically touch and see. But at the same time, we can touch and see the things that he created, which gives us constant evidence or should give us constant faith in his existence, in the power that he has. I mean, when I look at the the clouds and, and the sunset and all this stuff, it's just like there's the evidence right there that gives me more faith, that, that secures me, that, that shows me, oh, wow, the sun came up today. Oh, wow, I can breathe. Oh, you know, it's sort of the sense of count your blessings, count the things God's done for you every single day and negativity will, will just fall away. You know, it's very easy to get, uh, become negative. However, I believe it's not within ourselves to save ourselves. I also don't believe in proclaiming things. I do believe in accountability to the things that we say and the things that we do, but it's by grace we've been saved, by faith, not of anything that we can do, but what he did for us. And when we recognize that, when we recognize that we can do nothing without him, when we recognize that we can always never do nothing without him, and that we need him for everything, then, I, then we... I believe we experience grace and I believe it because I've experienced it so within all that being said I thank you for watching I thank you for listening and I hope you can hear me very clearly this is a test sermon and uh, maybe you might have gotten something out of it I hope you did I don't really do the uh, writing things I wrote a sermon is what I mean but I felt empowered to do that because you know, a lot of complaints about hearing people preach the word, preach the word. Don't just, you know, say whatever. And I agree with that. I didn't really before in a sense of wanting it to be very natural for people and comfortable. And I want to be myself, but I can be myself still. And you can be yourself, hopefully. So like I said, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I, and... Uh, I got a lot of uh, practicing to do. That's all this is. You never master whatever your craft is. This is the craft or the calling that is on my life. And you have a calling as well. So whatever you do and all that you do, do it wholeheartedly for the Lord. Like your life depended on it. Because it does. The fire will test all things to see if it holds together or falls apart. Let's end on prayer. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for this sermon and this practice and the people who are willing to listen. I thank you for them. I pray you bless them. Father, I just, I ask you in this moment. I ask you to do, that we would do your will. That we would crave it. That we would seek it. We want it. We would desire it. We would think about it every day of our lives. I pray that for our audience. I pray that for whoever needs him. I pray that for myself. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you so much for today in this pulpit and your word. In Jesus' name, amen.